Hello and welcome to It's Murder Up North. In today's episode, I delve into the part Albert Pierpoint played after the war crime tribunals, which occurred at the close of the Second World War, in which hundreds of people were found guilty for the atrocities committed against millions of people during the conflict. Albert would find himself caught up in a media storm as he was assigned to carry out the executions of some of those sentenced to death. Although he was summoned to Germany on numerous occasions, he would also be called upon to carry out his duties at home, including the 1948 execution of a transgender man whose identity and sexuality may have contributed to them not having their sentence commuted to life in prison. The Second World War would bring Albert Pierpoint face to face with a very different type of woman. Those who epitomised what occurs when loyalty and duty lead to unspeakable acts of cruelty, when he was called upon to execute those who had been found guilty of war crimes. It would be these executions which would forever link his name with some of the darkest acts in history. It was a connection he never felt at ease with. Not because he had to carry out the executions, but because there were certain expectations placed upon an executioner. As Albert detailed in his autobiography, a person holding the role should, quote, avoid attracting public attention. He should clearly understand that his conduct and general behaviour must be respectable and discreet. Yet in 1945 any hopes of discretion were quashed, when it was publicly announced that Albert would be conducting the executions of those found guilty of war crimes in Germany, resulting in him becoming a court far too familiar public figure. As he made his way to board his flight to Germany, he was pursued across the runway by journalists and photographers, hoping to get a story from the man who would bring about the deaths of those who had inflicted pain, suffering and death upon millions of people. The full extent of the atrocities perpetrated during the war would come to light as Allied troops began to move in to Nazi-occupied territories. Amongst the more horrific acts was the imprisonment of people in concentration camps who were forced to carry out manual labour while enduring horrific and unimaginable treatment, with millions dying either due to maltreatment, murder or mass poisonings in the gas chambers. Such acts could not go unpunished, and in the summer of 1945, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, the United States and China came together to create a charter for an international military tribunal, its prime focus being to prosecute those who stood accused of one or more charges, these being conspiracy against peace, crimes against humanity, war crimes and the waging of aggressive war. The trials would take place over several years, with one of the earliest occurring in September 1945 in the town of Lundberg, where a British military tribunal held judgment over 44 individuals who had been involved in the operation of the concentration camps Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz. The proceedings would last for almost three months, resulting in 11 out of the 44 accused being sentenced to death, while others, depending on the level of their involvement, were sentenced to serve time in prison. Amongst those condemned to death was the Bergen-Belsen camp commander, Joseph Kramer, and camp doctor, Fritz Klein. They would be hanged alongside three women. On December 13th, 1945, with a scaffold erected in a chamber at the end of one wing of Hamlin Prison, Albert would begin the first of eleven executions to take place that day, with the men scheduled to be hanged in pairs, while the three female convicts would head to the scaffold one at a time. Unlike in the UK, the process would be different. Firstly, Albert would be conducting multiple executions in one day, and the bodies were removed from the noose just 20 minutes after the drop, while in the UK, the body would have remained for at least an hour. Albert was also expected to personally obtain the height, weight and age of each convict, a task he had usually performed by sight while covertly observing the condemned individual, or he utilised the prison records. This enabled him to make sure that the rope was measured accurately to ensure the drop resulted in a swift death. Due to the necessity to carry out multiple hangings at once, Albert was not able to be as thorough as he would have liked, but he had garnered enough experience to ensure each sentence was carried out smoothly. The first to be brought onto the platform was Elizabeth Falkenrath, 
who had worked as a hairdresser prior to the war, yet during it she would be stationed at both Auschwitz, where she was a supervising wardress, and Bergen-Belsen, where she would be arrested when the camp was liberated by Allied forces. Elizabeth was described by survivors as the most hated woman in the camp. The accusations against her ranged from aiding in the selection of prisoners for the gas chambers, to allegations that when an elderly woman approached her in order to ask for work, Elizabeth pushed the woman down some stairs to her death. She would be followed to the noose by 22-year-old Irma Gris, who would become the youngest woman to die judicially under British law in the 20th century. Aside from her age, many noted her beauty, with Albert recalling that she was, quote, as bonny a girl as one could ever wish to see. Yet behind this youthful and fair facade was a brutal individual, fiercely loyal to the Nazi regime, she had served at Ravensbrück, Auschwitz, and Bergen-Belsen, where she committed the most horrendous acts, with Albert commenting in his autobiography that, quote, this blonde twenty-one-year-old who habitually carried a riding whip to lash prisoners to death, had, it was stated by one of her fellow guards in the camp, been responsible for at least thirty deaths a day. Irma Gris was hanged at three minutes past ten on the 13th of December, 1945 and thirty-five minutes later she would be joined in death by forty-two-year-old Johanna Bormann, who was known as the Woman of Dogs, due to her propensity to have her wolfhounds attack prisoners. She was also accused of carrying out vicious beatings and aided in the selection of prisoners for the gas chambers. Having completed his duty, Albert returned to Britain, where he would continue running his public house and carried out the execution of Neville Heath, who had murdered Dory Marshall and Marjorie Gardner in 1946. All the while, public interest in Albert's role as executioner was swelling. In May 1947, Albert would return to Germany to hang those condemned to death following the trial of officers who had served at the Ravensbrück concentration camp. Amongst those he was due to execute were five women, although one, Carmen Murray, would end her life prior to her sentence being carried out, and another, Vera Salvacourt would have her sentence delayed. The other three would meet their demise on Friday the 2nd of May 1947, the first being Dorothea Binns, who had been accused of physically abusing the inmates at the camp, either through violence or starvation. She had also been responsible for ordering mass shootings and gassing prisoners. It was alleged by one German magazine that Dorothea had attempted to end her life while in prison, and it is claimed that as she was led to the scaffold, she told an officer, quote, I hope you won't think that we were all evil people. She was followed to the noose by Elizabeth Marshall, a nurse who was accused of giving prisoners lethal injections, and was said to have assisted Dr. Percival Trite while he conducted experiments on inmates. Elizabeth showed a particular brutality towards pregnant women and those who had just given birth. She would insist that despite their condition, they were still expected to carry out manual labour, one witness would testify that Elizabeth had forced 50 women and babies into a castle car where they were left to die of starvation. In response to the accusations against her, Elizabeth stated, I was not always nice, but when you think of the people who came into the camp and who did not always behave properly, then it is very possible that I wasn't very nice. But I can say that I always listened to them and tried to be as fair as possible. Greta Bussell would be the next woman to meet her death at Albert's hands. Like Elizabeth, she too had been a nurse, with Greta being assigned the role of work input overseer. It was her duty to determine the health and physical capability of the inmates, with her basically deciding who lived or died. It is alleged that she once stated, let them rot if they can't work. A month after these executions, Albert would return to Hamlin Jail to carry out the sentence of Vera Salvacourt who had been due to hang alongside the previous three women. Yet she had written an appeal to King George VI, requesting a reprieve in exchange for the schematics of the V-2 rocket. However, in argument against her being shown mercy, the Deputy Judge Advocate General Lord Russell wrote, Vera Salvacourt, until now, has made seven absurd and inconsistent statements, three during the trial, one in her own defence and in the two petitions made since the trial. It seems clear that one can rely neither on her written nor her spoken word. With this damning statement against her, Vera would be sent to the noose on Thursday the 26th of June, 1947. 
The following year, Albert would carry out three final female executions. The first taking place on the 29th of July, when Ruth Clausius was brought to the scaffold. Of all those who were convicted of war crimes, Ruth was one of the few who confessed to her actions, with her testifying to being responsible for sending many female prisoners to the gas chambers. In her statement, Ruth disclosed, quote, During my activity, approximately 3,000 women were selected for the gas chamber accordingly. She proceeded to describe the prisoner's final journey, stating, When the vans were completely filled, both SS men and I drove in the direction of the crematory. There we had to unload the prisoners at a tool shed. In my function, I ordered them to undress. When all women were undressed, a disguised SS man in a white coat brought the women, one after the other, to another tool shed. When this shed was filled, it was locked. Then two male prisoners were ordered to enter the roof. I have seen how they dropped something there. Then the opening of the roof was closed. After the two prisoners had climbed down from the roof, the mortars of the lorries were switched on, so that the screaming of the victims could not be heard. The murdered women were told that they were being transported to a better camp, named Mitvida. This did not exist, and was simply a codename for gassing in one of the three mobile gassing vans, or the static gas chamber in the tool shed. Although Ruth confessed to her involvement, it is believed it was not out of guilt or remorse with many speculating that she appeared proud of what she had done. Following her execution, Albert would end the lives of two more convicted female war criminals on the 20th of September 1948. There was little known about Ida Schreiter, save for the fact she was convicted of working prisoners to death, neglect, and assisting in the selection for the gas chambers. Her fellow convict, Emma Zimmer, had been responsible for the deaths of mentally ill prisoners by ordering them to be sent to the Bernberg Euthanasia Centre. While working as a warden in Auschwitz, Emma's cruelty was distinctly remembered by one survivor, who would testify, quote, Our supervisor was an old and mean SS woman called Emma Zimmer. She was vicious and dangerous and frightening us constantly with threats, proclaiming in a sadistic voice, I will report you, and then you will go away. You know where, just one way up the chimney. We hated her and were scared of her. In the post-war years, Albert would carry out the executions of over 200 people convicted of war crimes, including the women mentioned. He described this time as exhausting, having to conduct multiple hangings in one day. Yet he also tried to maintain his thorough and methodical manner that he had developed since he took up the post. And as he had done with the executions he carried out in Britain, Albert made an effort to be as ignorant as possible regarding the charges against the person he was due to hang, and strove to give each a swift death, always mindful that he had been trusted to carry out the sentence, and he was sworn to fulfil his duty, no matter the individual's creed, colour, or gender. Although Albert would be summoned to Germany on numerous occasions, he still had responsibilities to tend to in England. He spent the majority of his time as the cheerful landlord of his pub helped the poor struggler, which was located 20 miles from the town of Rottenstall, where in the early hours of August 29, 1948, a bus carrying employees from the Corporation Bus Company made its way down Bacup Road. The passengers on board were heading home after a union meeting, while some talked, others sat quietly, eager to return home after a long shift. As the bus neared Rottenstall Cricket Ground, the driver abruptly applied the brakes and brought the vehicle to a sudden stop. Amidst protestations from the passengers, some of whom had been flung forward by the rapid halt, the driver alighted the bus and cautiously headed towards a bundle that had been illuminated in the headlights. As he approached, he realised it was the body of an elderly woman, lying on her front with her head resting on her arm. The driver attempted to raise her but got no response, and swiftly the alarm was raised. By quarter past four that morning a doctor had arrived at the scene and confirmed that the woman was deceased. It was initially suspected that she had been the victim of a hit and run due to her position in the road. This speculation was quickly discarded when a closer inspection revealed injuries to the head, which did not fit with the idea that a vehicle had struck her. As the police gathered at the scene, they came to the realisation that they were dealing with the first known murder committed in the town. Rottenstall was like many Lancashire towns, which had grown under the prosperity of the Industrial Revolution. 
gigantic mills with their towering chimneys dominated the once rural landscape, where farming and mining had once been the primary trade. By 1948, the population had swelled to 26,000, yet the worst crimes the police force had faced were mainly theft or the odd violent incident. Faced with the first murder, at least in living memory, the decision was made to call for the assistance of Scotland Yard. While awaiting the arrival of the officers from London, the Rotten Stall Force were not idle as they began their quest for the culprit. Due to the extent of the injuries to the woman's head, it was suspected that they were looking for a male, and as the woman appeared to have no bag or purse, they believed the motive was robbery. Going off the few clues they had, they sought to garner more information by conducting door-to-door -door inquiries and the search for the potential murder weapon. One thing they did know was the identity of the woman. She was Nancy Chadwick. Known as old Nancy in her hometown of Rottenstall, the 68-year-old widow was seen as an eccentric character. Her husband had passed away in 1921, and since then she had maintained an active social life, visiting with friends in the town regularly, and on an evening she would tell fortunes using tea leaves or playing cards. One resident, who had known Nancy for over 30 years, recalled that she dressed to look poor. She often sat in the public parks counting her money. She was very eccentric and used to roam about on her own. Despite her manner of dress, Nancy had a steady income which afforded her a comfortable life. This was primarily thanks to a former employer, for whom Nancy worked as a housekeeper. Upon his death, he left her four houses in his will from which she was able to acquire a fortnightly rent. To supplement this income, she also worked as a housekeeper for 82-year-old John Edward Whittaker, whom she visited on the morning of the 28th of August 1948. However, the rest of her movements that day was still a mystery to the police, and they hoped that interviewing people who lived in the vicinity of the crime scene would help create a timeline of events. Nancy's body had been discovered lying a few feet away from the door of 137 Bacup Road, a small two-room terraced house that sat opposite the cricket ground. Due to the home's proximity to the crime scene, it was hoped that the occupant may have some pertinent information. Just four hours after the body had been discovered, Detective Sergeant Thompson knocked on the door of the house and was greeted by the sleepy resident, still clad in their nightwear. D.S. Thompson was informed by the individual that they had not heard or seen anything unusual that night, and when provided with a description of the victim, they denied knowing them. Unable to acquire any useful information, the detective thanked the resident for their time and moved on to continue his investigation. While officers approached potential witnesses, others had entered the River Irwell, which flowed close to the crime scene, and was a potential disposal site for the murder weapon. As the officers dredged the depths, a crowd gathered on the banks, and from their midst a call came out alerting them to the presence of a bag floating in the water. Upon its retrieval, the item was determined to be a string shopping bag, within which there was a brown full leather handbag. This held a sewing kit, some scissors, a pack of playing cards, yet no purse or money was found, adding to the theory that the murder had been committed for financial gain. It has also become apparent that the murder had occurred elsewhere with Nancy's time of death being placed some ten hours prior to her remains being found. Officers had also spoken to attendees of the union meeting at the bus depot, who walked past the crime scene fifteen minutes prior to the body being found, and they reported that they did not see anything unusual. Despite this information, the police were no closer to determining the identity of the killer. Years later it would be alleged that an individual had been held for questioning on that Sunday night, they were released the following morning. The investigation would once again be brought back to 137 Bacup Road, at whose front door Nancy's body had been found. It was also the occupant of this home who had made the police aware of the bag floating in the river. So officers returned once more to question the individual who lived there, a person known locally as Margaret Allen. In modern times, Allen would have been considered as someone who suffered from gender dysphoria, as for most of their life, they felt like they were a man born in the wrong body. However, in contemporary sources, Alan was referred to as a woman, and many of the quotes I will use will refer to him as such, as at the time being transgender was not recognised or fully understood. I feel it is important to bear this in mind, 
as the attitudes at the time may have contributed to Alan's mental state. Going forward, I shall refer to Alan using the pronouns he, him, or their preferred name, Bill. In what was considered strange or eccentric behaviour by the community around them, Bill would opt to dress in a masculine manner and chose to wear their hair in a shorter style. So when the door to 137 Baker Road was answered, on Wednesday the 1st of September, the officers were greeted by a woman wearing trousers and a man's shirt. Chief Inspector Stevens of Scotland Yard had headed to the property to follow up on a statement given by Bill the day prior. As he stepped over the threshold, Inspector Stevens observed the dishevelled and unkempt state of the home, and noticed as Bill closed the door, there appeared to be dried blood smeared on the frame. Having obtained permission to carry out a cursory search of the tiny living space, Chief Inspector Stevens found a shopping bag within a small cupboard. Opening it, he observed that it contained ash from a fire and three rags, one of which was wet. Bill explained that the ashes were from the fire in the upstairs room and that the rags had been used to clean the floor. But upon being questioned about when he had last used the cloth, Bill responded in an unexpected manner. Silently, he strode across the living room, grabbed a coat off the back of a chair, before turning to the officer and suggested they should leave, so he could tell the police what had occurred. Sat in the interview room at Rottenstall Police Station, Bill admitted killing Nancy Chadwick, and provided a detailed statement of the events surrounding the 68-year-old's death. In his confession, Bill stated, I was coming out of the house on Saturday morning about 9.20am, and Mrs Chadwick came round the corner. She asked me if this was where I lived, and could she come in. I told her I was going out. I was in a nervy mood and she just seemed to get on my nerves, although she had not said anything. I told her to go and she could see me sometime else, but she seemed to insist on coming in. I happened to look around and saw a hammer in the kitchen. At this time we were talking just inside the kitchen with the front door shut. On the spur of the moment I hit her with the hammer. She gave a shout and that seemed to start me off more. I hit her a few more times, but... I don't know how many. I pulled her body in my call house. He also told officers, I looked in her bag, but there was no money in it. I did not kill her for that. I didn't actually do it for the money. I was in one of my funny moods. At the time, Bill's confession was not questioned, yet in subsequent years there would be concerns raised regarding some of the details. For instance, Bill claimed that Nancy was killed between 10 o'clock that Saturday morning, Yet there were individuals who claimed they had seen the 68-year-old later that day. These witness sightings are also consistent with the post-mortem determination that Nancy had died around about 8pm. However, eyewitness testimony cannot always be reliable, and unbeknownst to the doctor who attended the crime scene and provided a time of death, Nancy's body had been kept in a cold storage space, which may have delayed the natural decay of the remains. As witness testimonies and Bill's statements were combined, the police were able to create a picture of what Bill had done following the murder. With the killer placing the body in a coal cellar, Bill headed out to a pre-arranged meeting with his friend Danny, whom he joined to do some food shopping before the pair headed to the local Ashworth Arms for a drink. The pair parted ways at quarter past twelve and Bill travelled to the nearby town of Bacup to visit his sister, but learning she was out, Bill spent time with her neighbour to await her return at half past four. By quarter past nine that night, Bill had returned to Rottenstall and headed to the Ashworth Farms, where he remained until closing time at 11pm. Either too drunk to care or simply unfazed by the body in the coal cellar, he mounted the narrow staircase and headed to bed, where he managed to briefly fall asleep. Yet he admitted that shortly afterwards, he was awoken by the quote, thought of what was downstairs kept me awake. I went downstairs. I could not tell the time as all the clocks were broken. There was no lights in the road and I could not hear footsteps. Bill stated that he intended to dispose of the body in the River Irwell, but found he did not have the strength to move it and struggled to drag the remains out of the cellar and into the street. Unbeknownst to him, he had narrowly missed being spotted by the employees who had been attending the union meeting at the bus depot, as they walked past the house about 15 minutes prior to the body being discovered. Having failed to successfully move the body, Bill turned his attention to the murder weapon and Nancy's bag. 
hopped into the scarred of both in the River Irwell, which was a couple of minutes' walk from his home. Later that day, Bill would return to the river bank to observe the police search and inadvertently drew attention to himself by pointing out the bag floating in the water. With the body outside his home and other incriminating evidence discarded, Bill returned to bed, but had not fallen asleep when he had heard the bus coming to a stop in the street. Peering unseen from his window, he watched as his crime was discovered. Shortly after, Bill climbed into bed and was woken by the sound of Detective Superintendent Thompson knocking on the front door. Further questioning of the suspect led to details regarding how Nancy and Bill had become acquainted, with it being discovered that the pair had met recently while at a mutual friend's home, during which Bill had offered to give Nancy some sugar, despite the item still being rationed. Yet Bill failed to keep his promise, and a week after making the arrangement, he had called at Nancy's home to discuss the matter, after which Bill was witnessed leaving in a disgruntled manner. The importance of this was that this meeting had occurred just an hour prior to Nancy's death. As the saying goes, there are always two sides to every story, and many believe that Bill hadn't told the whole truth regarding the dispute over the sugar. Locals speculated Nancy had loaned Bill some money in exchange for some sugar. When Bill failed to keep his side of the agreement, Nancy had decided to confront him about it. After the initial confrontation at her home, Nancy had gone to her employer's Mr Whitaker's house, and it is believed that she disclosed her frustration regarding the sugar incident. However, whatever Mr Whitaker knew, he took with him to his grave, with him ending his life just prior to the trial. Having completed her duties at Mr Whitaker's house, Nancy was walking down Baycup Road, when, by what may have been a chance encounter, she saw Bill leaving his house, and Nancy seized the opportunity to confront him regarding the sugar. It seems a petty reason to kill someone over a dispute about sugar. Granted at the time it was still subject to rationing, and saw a valuable commodity, but the local speculation regarding Bill owing Nancy money does have some weight to it, particularly when one takes into account that he had been struggling financially for several months, although Bill's life, in general, had not been easy. He was one of twenty-two children, with his early years riddled with poverty, and while his siblings moved away and got married, Bill acquired a job at a local mill and continued to live with his mother, who ensured he had clean clothes, a hot meal, and managed the finances. With the outbreak of the Second World War, men were called up to serve. This led to once male-dominated roles having to be filled by women, with no shame or stigma attached to them doing so. Bill took up work as a bus conductor, a job he thoroughly enjoyed, and for the first time it allowed him to embrace his masculinity without judgement. Throughout his life, Bill was a misfit, a loner, and a misunderstood individual. Growing up, he felt different to his peers, confused about his gender and sexuality. This led to self-imposed isolation. He continued to live at home until he was 37 years old, when his mother passed away, forcing Bill to face the realities of life for the first time. Three years after his mother's passing, two events would take place in Bill's small and isolated world. He developed vertigo, which in turn forced him to cease working as a bus conductor, removing both financial security and the social interactions that came with the position. He also met Annie Cook, a divorcee who became Bill's only friend and in some ways a surrogate mother. Aside from the pair frequenting the local pub and going on shopping trips, Annie and Bill also went on a brief holiday together. Not long before the murder occurred, the pair headed to Blackpool, where Bill signed them into a hotel under the names Mr and Mrs Allen. Although Annie would later acknowledge that despite Bill having intense feelings towards her, their relationship was always platonic. Annie witnessed a change in Bill in the months leading up to Nancy Chadwick's death. Although his home had always been unkempt since his mother's passing, its condition worsened as Bill fell into a mental decline and grew overwhelmed by increasing debts. Bill seemed to have a disregard for his own well-being. Despite having little money, he would opt to buy cigarettes instead of food, and it wasn't just his home that needed to be tidied up. Bill showed little interest in taking care of his own appearance, with Annie recalling that her friend had caught completely let herself go. Seeing her friend struggling, Annie had tried to help by taking on the role his mother once fulfilled. She tidied the home and encouraged Bill to get out of the house and look for work. 
Annie would later tell Hugo Timberry, the authors of The Daughters of Cain, that, quote, I kept telling her to find a job and pull herself together. I was in the house when she sold her gas stove for £9 and wanted her to pay the rent with it before she was put out, but she didn't seem to care. The house was dirty. Sometimes I used to tidy up for her. The police got a shock when they went in there. Annie also recalled that Bill's mood would be unpredictable. One moment melancholic, the next euphoric. Then he may become irritable or angry. Concerned for her friend, Annie recalled one instance when she tried to lift Bill's spirits, telling him, quote, Don't sit mopping about the house. Get up and have some proper food. This prompted a startling reaction from Bill, who rushed away from Annie and placed the gas tube from the stove in his mouth and turned on the tap. Although she managed to talk Bill out of this heightened state, it increased Annie's concern for her friend. It has also been speculated that Bill had entered the menopause, and this had added to his sullen disposition. Menopause symptoms can range from hot flushes, changes in mood, issues sleeping and increased forgetfulness, while concentration can become harder. It is a difficult process for any woman, but for Bill it had an added complication. He had always been uncomfortable in his own body, and was now having to come to terms with one of the major biological moments in a woman's life. Had the pressure of the last six months built up to the point that Bill finally lashed out in the deadliest way possible, he had no explanation for why he killed Nancy, except to say that he was taken by one of his funny moods. Whatever had caused him to commit the crime, he would soon be made to stand trial for his actions. At the beginning of December, the hearing commenced at the Assizes in Manchester, and despite it being a murder trial, it would be relatively short, with the whole hearing lasting just five hours. In Bill's defence stood Mr Gorman, who attempted to garner sympathy for his client, who revealed had had an operation which Alan was convinced had, quote, made her into a man. At the time, the only likely procedure Bill could have been referring to was a hysterectomy, yet the defence used this to highlight that Bill was an unstable individual, perhaps not entirely of sound mind, who had committed, quote, a purposely fatuous and mad murder. While the defence focused on Bill's mental state, the prosecution argued that the murder was a callous act purely for financial gain. Mr Dennis Gerrard highlighted the fact that Bill had been in arrears and was facing eviction. The prosecution's argument was strengthened by the prison doctor's testimony, in which it was observed that Bill did not demonstrate any unusual behaviour, showed good judgment and clarity of mind which did not suggest insanity. Although Bill did not take to the stand, it was known that he had confessed to the crime, and his defence lawyer's final statement would act as his last hope for any form of reprieve. Mr Gorman put to the jury, quote, What sort of woman was this? With him then proceeding to answer the question for them. She was going through the change of life, and in that stage the most extraordinary things can happen. Bill's crime was not premeditated and lacked a definite motive. It was committed in a moment of passion, and so a recommendation of mercy was anticipated, yet wasn't forthcoming. When the jury of nine men and three women returned after deliberating for just fifteen minutes, they announced a guilty verdict, but did not make a plea for clemency. It seems that Bill had accepted his fate. He did not appeal the verdict, yet his devoted friend Annie hoped to have his sentence commuted. She started a petition on his behalf, diligently approaching people in the town of Rottenstall. With its population of 26,000, she hoped to garner some support, yet she only managed to acquire 152 signatures. Nor did the Home Secretary see any special circumstances to grant a reprieve, ordering that Bill's execution should go ahead in accordance with the law. At a time when death sentences were being commuted to life terms, what made Bill's case different? Why was he not spared? As stated, the crime was not premeditated and had no clear motive, and he had confessed to his actions, all of which saw others' sentences commuted to life. So why did Bill Allen have to hang? In The Daughters of Cain by Hugo and Berry, the authors put forward the possibility that it was Bill's sexuality that contributed to his fate. In the text, it is stated that Bill did not conceal the fact he was a lesbian who preferred to dress in what was considered masculine attire. To those in the local community who knew him as Maggie, they perceived this behaviour as being, quote, strange and eccentric. 
and when Bill, who at the time would have been considered a woman, appeared in court, dressed in trousers and a shirt, with his hair in an eaten coat, he did not conform to what was deemed to be socially acceptable at the time. And although being a lesbian was not a criminal offence unlike homosexuality, it was still considered morally wrong. Always a loner and a misfit in his community, few people mourned his passing, except for Annie, who on the day of Bill's execution headed to the corner of K Street and Bacup Road, where the pair had often met, where she stood in silence, although her vigil was disturbed by jeers from onlookers. Annie had to contend with the aftermath of the murder and loss of her friend, with her reflecting on what could have been if things had been different. She disclosed to Barry and Hugot that every Saturday morning she had called at Bill's house, yet the Saturday of the murder she had been busy and arranged to meet Bill in town instead, leaving her to wonder if she had kept to their routine would the murder have occurred, or would she have walked in on the crime being committed. As for Nancy Chadwick, her murder has become all but forgotten, save for a few locals in the town. No plaque commemorates the spot where she died. The row of terraced houses in which Bill Allen once dwelt have been demolished, replaced by a car park, removing all traces of the first known murder to occur in the town of Rottenstall. Thank you for joining me for this episode of It's Murder Up North. Join me next time as I delve into the case of the Blackpool Poisoner. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows. 